So terrific, thanks so much. It's really a delight to be here with everyone. And uh, I am uh, speaking only for myself and uh, opinions that I express are not necessarily those of my employers or institutions, but they should be. So in my own work, uh, I've had the privilege of funding lots of research on economics and social science, and that produces data sets that are about people. And these have sometimes been described as either the new oil or as public goods. And those are two different metaphors with two different implications. And I wanna talk about what that means for data reuse. So there are laws and expectations about how people reuse data. And um, there are examples of uh, legal and moral restrictions on the reuse of personal data for purposes other than those that were originally intended. And these are codified in GDPR, in the new California Consumer Protection Act, in Title 13 concerning federal statistics, not to mention uh, proposed changes to the common rule several years ago. So everyone who's ever tried to uh, anonymize a, a data set knows that there's a trade-off between privacy and accuracy, but the two considerations that I've listed here are really uh, the most important. That data reuse threatens research validity if the results are not accurate, and data reuse threatens research legality if the results are not privacy preserving. If you've ever tried to anonymize a, a data set, then you know that you uh, have to deal with this trade-off between privacy and accuracy, um, and that that's really difficult. And one of my messages is that it's not just difficult, uh, but mathematically speaking, it's really impossible to anonymize a data set in any useful way. So let me explain a little bit more of what I mean. Um, let's imagine a repository that's trying to uh, facilitate the reuse of sensitive data. And an analyst comes along who wants to know the value of f of x, the result of a calculation on the data set x. And for simplicity, you can really think of f as a counting query of the sort that goes into making census tables. There's a theorem uh, called the reconstruction theorem that says that if the curator answers too many such questions too accurately, then the analyst can essentially just reconstruct the entire data set. Now you might say that's a theoretical uh, curiosity. Uh, is that actually practical? Well, a team set out to do this with the census tables that were released in 2010. And those are of course very accurate data, but uh, uh, very um, as accurate as it could be, but very large data. There's a lot of questions there. And um, it's also very aggregate data. So you would think that, um, and indeed people did as much as they could to protect that data at the time. And it turns out for millions and millions of Americans, uh, perhaps a third of the, of the population, depending on how you count, you can uniquely specify and re uniquely re-identify who they are from the census table alone. So you can find that there's only one person of this age and that gender who lives here and so on. And once you've found that out, it's very easy to go to Palantir or any of the other data vendors and find out uh, thousands and thousands of fields of information about them. So this is a, actually a practical consideration. It's really not very hard for, for people to do that kind of a reconstruction attack. On the other hand, if you want to protect privacy, if you want to very specifically limit how much an analyst can learn about whether the data set X is equal to D or a neighboring data set D prime. And by neighboring, I just mean that it differs in one row. So I'm imagining that each one of us has a row for our personal data and that row might be missing in D prime and it might be present in D. So uh, if, if you can't really distinguish between D and D prime by the answers that uh, the curator is giving you, then certainly I've, I've protected privacy because you can't even tell if I'm in the data set. So it certainly limits my participation risk. And in order to do that, the, the curator can't return the value of f of x precisely, but they can answer by returning the value of f of x plus a small amount of, of carefully chosen random noise. And that protects me against, as I say, participation risk. 
it may not uh, protect me uh, from any other harms. Uh, if I'm a smoker, for example, uh, my insurance rates might go up because of uh, the findings of some study. But uh, that would be just about the same, regardless of whether I participated in the study and, and allowed my data to be used or not. So that's the strong sense in which it guarantees privacy. Just to uh, give a little more detail on this, the R, uh, if you make an Laplacian distribution, um, you can make its variance proportional to one over epsilon squared. And uh, in that case, this is called epsilon differential privacy, and it's an example of, an of a curatorial strategy that you could use. And what it says very precisely is that if you think about the Bayes factor that multiplies an analyst's prior odds of D versus D prime, in other words, of being able to tell if I'm even in the data set, that's what you have to multiply it by to get her posterior odds. So if that base factor were one, I learned nothing. That's entirely uninformative. But epsilon differential privacy implies that it's closer to one than epsilon. So that's exactly what it's telling you. In other words, that epsilon governs the, the trade-off, that inevitable trade-off between accuracy, which corresponds to larger epsilon, and more privacy, which corresponds to smaller epsilon. And setting an important, uh, appropriate value for epsilon star, how you make that trade-off, that's a policy choice. That's not a mathematical choice. It's something that policymakers have to, have to deal with. Um, but it's not a, a fix it once choice and just leave it because uh, everything that we've said so far is if you only ask one question, but all the researchers I know like to ask lots of questions. So once you do that, you have to think about a privacy loss budget. And here's the reason why. If I answer two questions with epsilon one and with epsilon two, then the total uh, of that uh, query, the total is epsilon one plus epsilon two. And if I want to maintain an epsilon star, uh, which is the total trade-off between accuracy and privacy, I have to make sure that epsilon one plus epsilon two comes out to be less than or equal to epsilon star. So in other words, it behaves just like a privacy loss budget. And it gets used up with each and every query. And this technique of differential privacy can slow the rate of privacy leakage, can, but it can't stop it. And even for sample data where privacy is not an issue, so if we're talking about rocks or stars, every qu uh, query that you ask inevitably leaks some validity. And again, differential privacy can slow that loss, but it can't stop it. So that brings me to the economics of evidence and the question I asked at the beginning. Uh, public good for an economist has two properties. It's a certain kind of commodity that's hard to prevent its use once it's out there. That's non-exclusive. And you don't use it out once it's out there. That's called non-rival. Public goods sound like they're wonderful, and they are, but they are no notoriously hard to finance. There are only two and a half ways of doing it. Either you have to finance a public good by taxes or by philanthropy, or sometimes you can bundle a private good with a public good and so on. But examples are lighthouses, basic science discoveries, national defense, and so on. And guess what? Uh, open open uh, data sets that don't have any privacy, those are public goods too. So they're, they're non-exclusive and you don't use them up. Oil, however, is rival. Once you use up a barrel, then nobody else can use that same barrel full. And my point here is that a sample data set's ability to generate safe and reliable evidence, that's rival too. Every query leaks some privacy, every query leaks some validity, and you can use differential privacy to control that. So this isn't the usual way that people think about these sorts of things, uh, but personally, at least, I find this rather inspiring. If you have a reference data set without any privacy issues, then if that's open, then it's a public good. But because it's a public good, you have to rely on cajoling and coercion and donations and norms and public spirit and all kinds of other unusual incentives and institutions to sustain them. And one of the examples that's pictured there is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. 
Sample data, on the other hand, and in particular, I've been talking about data that concerns people, that has privacy issues, that's instead, from this point of view, more of a normal economic good. And so it's subject to the familiar laws of supply and demand, of financing, price and quality competition, regulation. And that's true even if it's reused for, for research. And it's not a matter of coming up with better technologies or, or something more clever. These are theorems. And so that, that's just the way it is. And it seems to me like a way forward because we can't forever keep using and reusing every bit of uh, research data in a fair way, fair in all the different senses of that word. Uh, so eventually we will need mechanisms like these to help us set priorities. So that's my view and I look forward to the discussion.